Consistent self-improvement, everybody. You are now listening to American Gypsy Podcast. I'm your host, Classic. And I'm Gypsy. And today we have Sharon Lynn Wyeth. She's the founder and creator of Nomology Science. And she's author of several books, including Know the Name, Know the Person. Uh, it's great having you here, Sharon. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about like Nomology Science and how you came up? got started with this whole research? Yes, thank you for first having me on your show with you. I'm really excited to be with both of you. And I came up with it, I was in my first, uh, my sixth year of teaching, but it was the first day of the school and you you make up the seating chart, you don't know the students. And as I was just placing the kids' names randomly, I realized it wasn't random because I was saying, don't put Joshua next to Julie together. They're going to be clowns, but separated. They're okay. And Stephanie's going to be stubborn, put her over here on the side. And Derek's going to need extra help, put him up close. And when I got to my fourth class to do, I went, wait a minute, I'm acting like I already know these guys. And I'm just, you know, all I have is their names. So I went back and I wrote down what my impression was of each student by their name. And I put it aside until winter break because I wanted to get to know the kids for who they were. And so when I read it, I was just astounded at its accuracy. So I said, okay, my brain has come up with some kind of patterning or something. How do I make what's unconscious conscious? So I was a math major in college and I have my master's degree. So what I did is, at my, since my brain's really well trained in patterns, is I started making charts there's eight Davids in my life. And so I wrote down each David in the full name and then what I know about each one. And then I went for the overlap and the overlap of qualities. And I thought, okay, that comes from David. And then the rest has to come from somewhere else in the name. And so I did that. And it took me 15 years to figure out all the patterns and where the letter is placed makes a difference. If it's the first letter in the name, it's the first impression mm. that we give others. If it's the first vowel in the name, that's our communication style, what kind of gifts we like, how we express love, how we want to receive love. I mean, there's so much in that first vowel. If it's the last letter of the first name, it's what people say behind our backs first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the rest are considered middle letters. So those are subtleties that you have to know somebody longer to get to know. So the first name is the essence of who you are. Your middle name is what you're bringing in with you if you have a middle name. OK, um, and what you're strengthening and those are your gifts and talents that you're coming in with. And your last name represents your environment. So it started in the classroom. Wow, That's really neat. So how does nicknames work versus like real names? Because I know we use nicknames on this show. <laughs> a lot of people use nicknames. Um, a lot of times we don't give them to ourselves. Other people give us nicknames. Sometimes we give them to ourselves. And what that means is that. For that period of time that you're using that nickname or answering to that nickname, you're showing those qualities and those characteristics versus the ones represented in your birth name. Because mm -hmm. your birth name is your blueprint for this world. And then your nickname that you're going by is how you're going about that particular blueprint. Okay. So how would you look at our name? The or nicknames me, or the real my, ones? My real name being... Lee, okay. Lee Kwame Koran. So I look at it that you are highly intuitive. You have a lot of self-confidence. You, When you lead, everybody benefits because you're a natural leader. That you like to learn through experiences. You don't like to make the same mistake twice. That you, when you get on something and you got to get the work done, you're really good at it. Um, you may be slow to get started, but once you're started, it's like, okay, let's just keep going until we finish. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then you can quit. Um, what you like, you like to do what you don't like to do. Nobody can make you do, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, it's not happening. Um, you have a generosity of spirit that comes out periodically where you give away a lot of your time to others and you're very good to others. It also says that when you were growing up, you had parents that wanted to be in charge and it needed to be their way. So you learn definitely right from wrong and what's accepted and what's not accepted. You probably wanted a little bit more freedom than when you were growing up for what you had in there. But one of the things you came away with from your childhood was that you wanted to make the world a better place. Now, I can talk two hours on a name. So I just gave you a really <laughs> short little quickie. Uh, so with yeah, my I wife want, here. I want to hear my. No, 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 no. What oh. do you think as far as the evaluation that she gave that was, on me? That was pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Accurate. So, and we've been together over 10 years. So that's cool. 
Um, so, um, Gypsy, and your well, birth name. You can do, it, yeah, my birth name is fine. Yeah, it tells me that you have a great sense of humor, that you're very spiritual, that you don't want to do any more work than you have to. You'll get done what you need to get done. But then, hey, life's not all about work. Let's go have some fun. Um, it says that you make a very good host or hostess when you're giving a party. You're very um, concerned with how is everybody else doing? How are they feeling? Are they having a good time? You know, is everybody's needs met? And that you also want to make the world a better place. But you came in with that feeling. Uh, you also have generosity of spirit. And you're also one that, hey, if I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. You can't make me. You know, it's like all or nothing in that. Um, you also were taught to have a very logical, deductive, practical mind. So that if it was math, music, mechanics, anything that's a step-by-step -step approach, computers, you know, all of that comes easier to you because you were taught to do that. You were also taught that it's very important to know about the people around you and know information about them and stay you know, well-informed. So in case somebody needs something, you know, like, like there's a death in the family and they're going to need extra food or, or that somebody injured themselves. And now some of the family's going to need transportation because the one that got injured can't drive or whatever. It's, it's very important to you to know about what's happening to the people around you so that you'll know when to step in. Wow. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> that's pretty accurate. <laughs> you, even about the computers, because I'm actually a web developer. Uh, so okay, well, there you go. <laughs> interesting. And it, it always came easy to me, like computers and all of that. And, yeah, yeah, that logical deductive reasoning, you know, it would, it's in your name. So, of course, it comes easier than people that don't have that in their names. It's just the same way when HR people call me and so they give me names and they say, here's the job description. Who do you think we should hire? You know, then I'm looking for certain combinations because if somebody doesn't have logic and deductive reasoning in their name, I'm not going to say, oh, that's a good person to hire for a computer firm. You know, it's like, oh, no, skip this one. A different job's better for them. Wow. So I know you do like relationship work. So what can you find out about relationship based on names? Um, you can see where the potential problems are and where the similarities are. Like both of you have a lot of self-confidence and that's really important so that one doesn't run over the other one. Okay. Uh, that's for an example. You know, you both have a lot in common where you'll, you'll get the work done. Uh, Lee can be a little bit more driven. Uh, you know, um, classic can be a little bit more driven than you gypsy at times or want to work a little longer when you're saying, okay, we did enough for today, <laughs> you know, um, but you both want to get the work done. That's responsible. You're both, not wanting to um, do something that you don't like doing. It's like, no, somebody else needs to do this. I don't want to do it. You know, mm -hmm. um, you both have generosity of spirit. So, and you're both willing to listen, which is really nice. And I'm sure that there's a lot of laughter in your home because you both have a lot of um, what I want to call great humor skills to get together, mm -hmm. you know? So you look at that. And so that makes it, you have compatible communication styles where you get each other, you understand each other, you're not in conflict. It's not like a lot of misunderstandings because you have compatible, uh, you know, communication styles. And it's, it's interesting because it's like you both want to make the world a better place, but you both want to do it a little differently. Where classic is like, let's do what feels right. Okay, this feels right. So let's do it this way. And Gypsy, you're like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. We need to do what's logical. <laughs> we need to make it have sense. Okay. So between the two of you, you've got the mind covered and the heart covered because you've got both intuition and you've got, um, you know, the mental mind going. So you've got both sides of it. So together you make a really good unit. Thank you. Yeah. We are a good unit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've learned a lot on this podcast and even building it was, you know, it's been pretty fun, but it's kind of been that pace that you explained it. Okay. Let's, you know, take a break for now. And one is like, okay, let's keep going. And it's that exact energy. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, I always joke that there's not a lot of secrets once you know somebody's real name, what's on their birth certificate. My slogan is from the bedroom to the boardroom. Once you know a name, there are no secrets. <laughs> that is an amazing gift to have, though. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's science, how it's figured out. 
So if you just know what combinations mean what, then anybody can do it. It's just learning it. And that's what my books teach is like, how can anybody do this? You don't have to be psychic. You don't have to have intuition, Mm -hmm. even though I think everybody does, but just to varying degrees. Um, You literally can just, it's, it's learning like this letter in this position means this, (laughs) you know, it's pretty cut and dry. Interesting. How is that different from numerology? Because we're into numerology. Okay, so in numerology, you get three numbers from the birthday and three from the name. First of all, you have to have that person's cooperation because they have to tell you what their birthday is. So in nameology, I don't do anything with the birthday, so I don't need to have that information. The minute somebody introduces themselves to me and I have the full name, I'm off and running. In numerology, you have six positions and six numbers. Okay, you work it out, three from the name, like I said, and three from the numbers. So each of those positions have nine possible values. Okay, so you have nine factorial divided by six, and that's how many possibilities you can have for different personalities and the way things are doing it. Now, you look at the name, you have 26 possibilities for every letter. And most names, when you're looking at the full name, are longer than six places or six letters. And plus you have everyone, instead of nine number possibilities, you have 26 letter possibilities. So you have a lot more detail, a lot more personalization, a lot more directed of this is particular to you. And so you're in a group of one instead of a group of many, if that makes sense how I said that. I probably have to watch the video back to get it back to you kind of <laughs> grab it a little bit more and to run it through a couple of times. But yeah. <laughs> that <does>. but, <laughs> You just, there's just a lot more choices. It's kind of like if you're learning Chinese, okay? A new language. In China, there's different dershans or sounds. And so every syllable can have four different dershans, okay? So you can have, look at it like a roller coaster ride. So let's take the word ma, okay? So you're starting off on the roller coaster and you're flat, you're level. So you would just say ma, there's no inflection. And so that's the first Dershan and ma with no inflection means mother. Then the next one, you're going up that roller coaster and you're going up on that steep hill because you need to get the the height. And so as you go up, that puts whatever you just said into a question mode. Now you've made it a question. So like ni hao is hello, but ni hao ma is how are you? Okay. Then the third one is you're going down on that roller coaster. And so... Uh, and then you're coming back up again, okay, because you're not at the end of the ride. So when it goes down and up, you go ma. <laughs> so it's a down and an up, and that means horse, okay. And then you have the fourth dershan, which is ma, and it almost sounds like you're mad. And I didn't have to use that one a lot, so I don't remember what it means. So anyway, you have four different ways of saying every syllable. So let's say you have a two syllable word. Well, you have four ways you can say the first syllable and four ways you can say the second syllable. And that's 16 different ways that you can use those two syllables and they will have 16 different meanings. Okay. So I'm going to go back to numerology. You would have nine in the first position, nine in the second position. So that's 81 ways. Then times the nine times the nine times the nine times the nine. Okay, but now you're looking at a name and you're going to have 26 times 26 times 26. Can you see how your numbers of individualization gets larger right away with however long that name is? Yeah. Okay, so it's a lot more specific to to you. And I look at it that it's a whole lot easier to learn because it's all in incredibly simple patterns. So what took me 15 years to figure out, I can teach all the basics in 15 hours. So how does it work with like countries and naming conventions? Because I was born in America, but if I was born in um, where I grew up in Ethiopia or in Eritrea, my name would have been slightly different, like my last name. Um, the order of it, I guess. We don't really have middle names where I come from. So, how okay, does that so then work? you would just look at, and not everybody here in the United States has middle names either. Yeah. But all you'd need to know is what is the family name and what is the is the individual's name. And it doesn't matter which order it comes in. You just need to be able to designate this one's the family name and that one's the the person's name. Hmm. Okay. And the middle name lets you know where you go if you're different and you're under stress. 
So the people that don't have middle names don't change when they're under stress from what you see when they're not under stress. The people that have middle names can vary a little bit when they're under stress, depending on how compatible the first and the middle name is. The the middle name also tells you uh, your most immediate past, wherever you came from, whether it's a past life or in heaven or whatever you want to call it, wherever we were before we came here. Okay. It tells you what your strengths were and what your gifts were. So when you don't have a middle name, it's simply saying you were on the other side of the veil for so very long that none of that's important for what it applies here. Hmm. So how do I've heard you say like kids pick their parents or their names before they get here? How does that work? Can you explain that? Okay. So when they were still only seven religions on the planet, before they multiplied and divided and everybody picked their own, I always say that jokingly, they, um, they all agreed on some basic understandings. And one of them was that the incoming soul impresses upon the person that's going to be naming them what they want to be called. So like if we were in Turkey, it would be the oldest male relative. Okay. And it's different in different cultures, but the soul knows who's going to come up with the name. And so they impress upon that person what they want to be called. Okay. So, and yes, you're absolutely right, Gypsy. You get to pick um, what you look like. You get to pick which genes you accept. I I laughingly picture it in my head, like you're going into a shopping mall and you've picked your parents. And so you've got all of their gene codes. Okay. So you take their gene possibility of codes for eyes and you go into the eye section of the mall and it says, here's all the different ways your eyes can look based on your parents. Which one do you want? What do you want to look like? And then you go into the nose store and it says, here's all the possibilities that your nose can look like based on your parents, you know, genetics, which one do you want? And you literally get to pick how you're, how you're going to look. You know, that was something else that all those religions agreed upon when there was still only seven on the planet. So So in other words, we look like we want to look. And our name is that like the blueprint that we want to have for our world. And then if we want to change how we go about that blueprint, then we go by a nickname. And traveling around the world doing research, like what's the most unique thing you've, you found out during your research? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's interesting that procrastination and different qualities show up in a name and that I wouldn't have expected. Okay. And it's interesting to me when we started comparing names, um, how you can foresee how well people are going to get along or not get along. But what's really fascinating to me is the, the timing that's laid out in a name. And that didn't come to me for quite a while. It was different people would ask different kinds of questions, which would go back to my research and I'd start looking for answers. And to know that your timing of what's going to happen when or where your focus is going to be is also laid out in the name. That to me was a part that was absolutely fascinating. Earth just keeps getting better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think about it, you're never going to meet a stranger if you know how to interpret somebody's name because you'd know how to talk with them. You'd know how to show them that you love them. You'd know what they need and able to consider a long-term relationship versus a short-term relationship. You'd know whether you connect first and then get your work done or whether you're going to get your work done and then connect. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you know, and that connecting piece is so important that literally on my website, knowthename.com, my third book, which is, that's all it's talking about. Know the name, know how to connect is accessible. You can access it by signing up on my website, any page, but the homepage, And then it shows you in the member section how to tap into that so you can read that third book absolutely for free because I think it's so important that we learn how to connect with other people and what's important to them. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, like, what's the difference between your books? I know they all start with know the name. Um, (laughs) Is that like the different aspects of how you use the science? Okay, so know the name, know the person is all about the personality and how you can know somebody's personality from their name. Know the name, know the spirit is from the soul's perspective. Why was the soul here? Why did the soul come? 
You know, what's the soul's purpose? And because we're living on the cusp between the age of Pisces and the age of Aquarius, we there's always overpopulation on a cusp time period because we can accomplish in one lifetime, which would normally take us three and a half lifetimes. And so because of that, instead of having two things that we're here really to get the experience for, we now have seven because we're on this cusp time period. And my understanding is the soul has the knowledge. We simply don't have the experience to go with the knowledge. So for an example, we could know Einstein's theory of relativity is E equals MC squared, but we may not know what the letters stand for, where you apply it, where you get the numbers that are going to go into those letters, when you need to tweak the formula, when a different formula would be more appropriate, because we all don't have the experience to go with that formula. So we're coming here for experience normally in two major areas, but in this lifetime, which is the reason that we can always feel like there's too much to do, is we're going to do seven areas. And the first two um, are what I call the boomerangs. They come around all the time from different ways, different directions, you know, and how they show up is always modifying and changing because if it was a regular lifetime, we were only doing two, those would be them. And then the next three are the, what I call the one and dones. So once you got the scale, you rinse and repeat. It's this tool in your tool bag. It's kind of like saying, if you, you came down to learn how to uh, present Mozart's concerto on the piano, then you would have to learn how to play the piano. But then if you wanted to play a different song, you don't have to relearn how to play the piano. You've already got that skill. So it's a one and done. And then the last two are what I call the gifts. So that when you accomplish those, because they were add-ons at the end, that there's always a gift that comes also in the current lifetime. So know the name, know the spirit tells you all the, the, the reasons that you're here from a soul's perspective and breaks that down for you. And then know the name, know how to connect simply focuses on the first vowel of the first name, which is where a lot of information lies to help us connect with each other and get along better. So that's the difference in the three. And then the fourth book is coming out fairly soon. It's in the, uh, the proofreading stage. And whenever they get through correcting my grammar or my punctuation or what, you know, they're in that stage. When that gets done, it'll come out. So it's expected shortly. And that'll be know the name, know the health, because your health predispositions are also laying in your name. So like both of you, for an example, having your names that you want to watch, always your immune systems. You have that in common. But it's very important to... Be aware of what foods help the immune systems and avoid the foods that don't help the immune systems, because that's one of yours that it says, if you can take care of that, then the body, the rest of it can take care of itself. And that's what you want to always want to know from health wise. So the last name says what you've inherited, your predisposition or your propensity for a certain disease or ailment that comes through the family lineage shows up in the last name. And um, in the first name is if you're not careful with your own habits and thinking patterns, then that's what you can create for yourself in this lifetime. And if you do have a middle name, it'll show in there any health issues you brought in with you so that you came in sickly in some way or another. So that book will come out next. Are there ways to tell a person's zodiac sign through their name? Um, I love that question. I wish I knew more about astrology because I know my friends that are astrologers get similar information that I do. I get it from the name and they get it from the birthday, the birthplace and, you know, that astrological chart. The name will show me the same qualities that you're going to find in astrology. And if I knew astrology better, I'd be able to say those qualities go to that sign. But I'm not there yet. I am in the process of learning astrology just so I can do that. Okay. Very interesting. So, like, what type of service do you offer with um, with this skill? Okay. So, the first time somebody has a reading with me, in the first half hour, I go through, why did you pick this person to be your mother? Why did you pick that person to be your dad? From a soul level, why would you choose them? What did you hope to learn from having those two people as your parents? And then I go through... Um, what your seven subsets are and what your overall reason for being here is. So that takes me a half an hour. And then in the next half hour, I go through your timing of what you chose to do when and where your focus is. 
And then I start on any questions that somebody has. So the more time that they give me, I can answer questions. I always say, if you could ask the universe anything, what would you want to know? That answer is probably in your name. And so give me your questions. And then you can also give me other people's names and their relationship to you that you want me to compare and how you can improve that relationship. So some people will give me their kids or their spouses or family members. Others will give me their bosses or their friends or their potential boyfriend, you know, or the person they're going up against in court or whatever. But you can also compare that. So it depends on what somebody wants done. But I always start the same because I think it's important to know why we're here. And however long somebody gives me up to two hours, um, I just give as much information as I can. The entire time is just packed with information because I think it's very important that we all know who we are and why we're here. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, now, we I offer different things to businesses. That's what I offer to individuals. Now, in businesses for real estate people, uh, they call me and they say, I just signed up. I'm going to sell this property. Here's the address. How do I want to write? You know, what day do I want to put it on the out there? Um, how do I want to write to attract the right people for this home so it sells very quickly? And so far, the majority of homes that I have worked with were, with relatives sell within two weeks or they get, they get offers that are, you know, good offers um, within two weeks. And so you can write it up because every home, according to the, the number of the street address tells you what it's going to be like for that person or people to live in that house. The, the street name tells you what your neighbors are going to be like. And the city name, if you dissect it from the letters, tells you what the government's going to be like and how intrusive they're going to be or how lenient they're going to be. And so relatives will call me and say, um, what price do I need to put down? You know, how do I need to write my description? Those type of things so that it can sell very quickly. Then attorneys will call me. I get to help choose juries. Sometimes I love doing that. Um, and we sit down and we say, what qualities do you want in these juries? So are you going to want them to decide emotionally what feels right? Do you want them to think logically just on the facts? Do you want a combination? What are we looking for? And then I can give them percentages as the name of the jurors are said um, on how close they come to what we've determined what we're looking for. And then the individual attorneys that go before a judge, you want to know what's going to address or pique that judge so that, that judge wants to side with your client more. So for an example, let's say a judge had fairness issues in their name, which I wish more of them did. Um, then you would say such and such happened and how fair is that? Or would you consider that fair? You know, you want to pique them on their own issues so that they have a lot of sympathy for your client. And at the same time, you want to use certain phrases and words that your client knows you're doing a really good job on their behalf so that even if you lose, you still get paid, okay? That they'll know that they don't fault you for it. And what we have found with the attorneys that use me consistently, their batting averages go up better at winning in that courtroom. Mm. And then um, I've worked with HR departments and they give me the the list of here's the job descriptions and here's the list of names of people hiring. And then who do you want to put where, you know, who should we hire? And I'll go through and I've been tested on this uh, with a very large company that was hiring a lot over a six month time period. And they would look at the applications that came in, read everybody's resumes and all about them. They would interview the person, they would call all the references, and then they would recommend a number one and a number two. And the HR person that was calling me would just give me the job description and the names. And within approximately 15 minutes, I'd say, here's your number one and here's your number two. And he never said anything. He would just go to the next, you know, job description. And he didn't want to send me anything early because he didn't want me looking anything up on the Internet or whatever. Like I had time to, <laughs> you know, I say that sarcastically. I didn't have time to look stuff up. Don't need to. And so at the four and a half month mark, he said, Every time for four and a half months now, in, in approximately 15 minutes, you've given me number one and number two, which has exactly matched what my people have given me, that this is who we ought to hire. But today, our number one and two is your number two and one. They're backwards. Why? So I let him know that 
um, that either one he'd probably be happy with. But the reason I put this one for number two, and I explained what I saw, and he said, you know, nobody would tell us that when we called for a reference. We don't talk about those type of things. And it would probably take us a year of him being here before we'd figure that out. And he said, you've been so accurate. We're going with your decision over our decision. So anyway, that was like seven years ago now. And, and I'm still employed by them when they go to do hiring. And so there's just a lot of different ways in business. Um, there was this one tech firm that had two really good employees, but they couldn't get along. And both of them came up to the HR person and said, if you don't get rid of this other person, I'm going to quit because I don't want to work with them. And so they called me in um, and I literally was able to say, okay, she's a micromanager and needs to be kept well informed. And that's bugging him with how much she's bugging him for information. And he's very independent and everybody loves him and he's really good, but he's being smothered. And so we worked it out where he would call in every evening before he went home because he was out with the clients and he would give like a five minute review and she would not pick up. So it would go on the answering column. And he'd say, okay, I saw this client and this is what happened today. And then I saw this one and this is what happened. So she kept well informed, which kept her micromanaging needs met. And he wasn't being bugged by her all the time for more information, which kept him happy because he knew it was five minutes a day. So they're still working there. And that was quite a few years ago. So it, you can solve problems because you can compare names and see how do I meet everybody's needs in a way that's not going to infringe upon the other person. So that's another way that HR companies use me. And then I've had a lot of businesses say, what do I name my business? I've had some businesses say, I'm ready to build this or that. And is this address a good place where we could be successful? I had this one lady, bless her heart, she owned like eight different businesses. And she goes, I don't understand why these two businesses aren't doing as well as these other six. And I said, what are the addresses? So I told her what the addresses meant. And I said, move go someplace else or else get the post office to change the darn numbers that are there and you'll watch your business will be better. And sure enough, she got the post office just to change one of the numbers into a more pleasing number and the business picked up and boomed, you know, and the other one, she ended up selling that place and moving and then it was just fine, but it was a different business than her other ones. And then it did well and it took off. So now she doesn't buy a building for any of businesses without calling me first. And so there's a lot of different ways you can use this in business, which I think is really exciting besides personal ways and able to improve your relationships. How did and you, it's simple. Sorry, I Go didn't ahead. mean to interrupt. I was going to say, yeah. how did you think to use it in this way or with some of these services, did a company or someone come to you and ask you uh, for your skills and you're like, okay, there's something there. How, how did you think to use it? In these ways. Okay, so the the ones that tested me for six months on the hiring, mm -hmm. um, he was given a half an hour with me um, as a birthday present. Okay, and when he realized how spot on I could be with, at that time I was just doing the names. Now I have a thing where hey, I really want you to get this foundation first in your first half hour. But in this case, it was so long ago, and he said, he goes, I just want you to tell me about these people, right? And he declared that I was so accurate. He said, he was the one that came up with it. He says, can you do this for people, the potential people that we want to hire? And I said, all I need is a name and I can tell you about the person. So I said, so give me the job description. So when they tested me for that six months, it was literally my first time using nameology science in that respect. Mm. And it's been, and then I had, uh, I met a relator and she said, well, how do you know if this house is right for somebody? And I said, well, it's easy. Let me look at the address. And so it took a while, but I figured out from looking at enough addresses, what the patterns were and what you could tell from an address for a house and then what kind of person it would attract. Because a few relatives that were friends were saying, how come this house isn't selling? And I'm a good relative. So what's going on? You know, and so we could look at it and figure it out. So it's literally different people have come up in the past and said, can we use it this way? Can you do this with it? And I'll go, well, let me take a look at it and see if I can figure it out. That's how all that stuff came about. I, I think you answered my last question with the address change um, that I had brewing about. I was going to ask what were the advantages and the disadvantages of maybe changing your, your name personally 
or as a business? Right. Well, if you're going to change a name, what I say to somebody is, or if I'm coming up with a business name for people, because I've named plenty of businesses, I say, first, what do you want people to know about you or your business? What are 10 qualities that you think are really important for people to know right away or just instinctively know and receive from, from the name? And I go, and then what are the 10 things, 10 qualities that you want in your clients, your customers, or the, your influencers, the people you're going to attract to you on a personal level? What are the qualities of those people? So like when I did this for me for the name of my company, I looked at it and number one was integrity. I want people that have integrity to be called to my work. You know, that to me was really important. But I wrote down, I did the same things for me. And so, and then... When I'm doing a name for a business, I say, and what exactly does your business provide for others? What's your service? Because that also needs to come through the name. When I'm doing a personal person that wants to change their name, I look at the birth name and I say, we don't want to change the soul's reason for being here. We want to incorporate it in the new name and have it come easier. Because like if if I was supposed to get from Los Angeles to New York, And that was one of my goals. I want to get on that airplane and get it done with already. I don't want to be hitchhiking and walking. You know, how can I do this in an easier way? And so we look at that also if I'm doing a personal name. And all of that goes into the recommendations. And then there's a lot of choices. So I'll say, okay, these are all the first names that are getting us, you know, what people will think of you. And let's pick a first name and then I can go through and see which of the last names would be compatible. And then, and there's a lot, there's not just one way to do it. Um, And same with a business name, you know, there's a lot of cooperation there with here are my suggestions. Now let's see which ones feel the best. So how does the podcast name American Gypsy, like what does that say to you or how do you interpret that? Well, I think it's really interesting because in American Gypsy, you have both the mind and the emotion. You want to capture people that are thinkers. You want to capture people that are feelers, you know, that have open hearts and and really care about people. But you also want them fairly smart. (laughs) You're saying, come on in, but we want this nice balance in the people that we attract. You're also saying in American Gypsy that your goal is to literally empower people to be able to do more or know more than what they knew before they listened to your show. It says that you want to be influenced, <laughs> you want to be influencers, and you want to have flexibility and help other people realize that with small changes, it can have big impacts on their life. So you're offering uh, guests and people that can show them a different point of view or a different way of thinking that can enliven and broaden their perspective so that their lives get better. And then it says, and we are always going to be in control of who we have on and where the direction goes. That's what your name means. American (laughs) gypsy. (laughs) That's pretty accurate. I'm here to learn from a lot of people, especially people like you. So I'm one of those people that, you know, you know, yeah, and it, what's agree. also cool in the name American Gypsy is that you guys have no tolerance for people that are not honest. You've got rebellious spirits. Don't tell us what to do. You can ask <laughs> and don't lie to us, because if you lie to us, you're out and gone. You don't get a second <laughs> chance. <laughs> That's very accurate. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So we're not going to take up too much of your time. And it's been awesome. Awesome. Um, talking with you and then getting this whole experience about names and everything is just it's been wonderful and this is not a you know I wouldn't say the only time we would love to also bring you back and talk well more I would love to more. do that and classic and gypsy I'm just so delighted that you guys said yes and invited me on your podcast and thank you and I guess before we close it out let them know where they can find your book and um, your website and everything well, a lot of stores carry the the books, but you can also get them on Amazon. But the least expensive place is on my website, knowthename.com. And that's also where you would go on knowthename.com to get access to the third book for free. And the, the coolest thing about the name, know the name, 
Facebook.com, as we've been talking about names this whole time, is if somebody's listening and they're doing something else and they can't write it down, the name of the website, and later on they go, oh, I need to know the name of that website. You'll go, oh, that was it. Know the name. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was very really, creative. Yeah, really smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can tell I was a school teacher. So when I teach this in classes, which are also available online, Easy when I learn. teach it, I use all of those mnemonic devices, same way I got my kids to be really good math students when I was teaching in the classroom because I have all those mnemonic little tricks to help people remember things. That's awesome. Yeah, I wasn't the best at math. It was I was going pretty good until I got around high school. And, you know, yeah. this may sound horrible, but I blame the teachers for that. I do as I, well. I can say that. I, well I just think those in particular in, teachers, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I was in education for 40 years, a 29 as a teacher and 11 as an administrator. So in my 29 years of teaching in that entire time, and I taught college classes at night in public school during the day, there was only three kids that entire time that I was not able to reach with math. So I really think it's how the teacher presents it. And are they teaching it in patterns? Can you see the pattern? Can you see where this pattern works or that pattern works? Uh, your students ought to be able to see how to do every math problem three to four different ways from different attacks, or else they don't understand the concepts behind the math and they're just memorizing. And so I really believe it to the teachers to do a better job. So if a child doesn't get math, I really blame it on the teacher, not the kid, as long as the kid's giving effort. Now, I have some kids that'll sit back and go, I dare you to teach me anything. And I just, you know, I just think I'm not going to force feed you, but you're missing a great opportunity because I know how to explain things. I think I'm close with that because I thought it was me at first, but then I'm, you know, my, my life that I've had doesn't say necessarily bad with math and I've always wanted to grasp it. But yes, I even had a college professor. I remember that would say, but after every <laughs> explaining things, you just go, what the? And, it just, and it goes out the window where everything we you may have been paying attention to here. All right, you get it. And it's like, it goes. So, I used to wear this t-shirt for this one college professor that I had. We made up these t-shirts and a bunch of us all wore them in because we had the beginning of the problem in the first few steps. And then we just put down on the t-shirt, magic happens and boom, you get the answer. It's like, what happened here in the middle? Why can't you explain that piece? <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Just magic. <laughs> you know, magic is looking it up in the back of the book and saying, this is now the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and let me use the book on the test too, right? I, I just, I really think when you, when the teacher understands it clearly and can teach it in patterns, then we all identify with different patterns because life is full of patterns. We have seasons, yes. that's a pattern. We have days that are 24 hours long, that's a pattern. You know, so many days make a week, <laughs> so many weeks make a year. You know, we're cooking, we're sewing, we're doing things that use math. Um, when I was doing an elementary school as the math specialist for that school, you know, and they were saying that the kids didn't like math. I was like, oh, come on, we can make everybody love math. And they did by the end of the year because it all relates to everyday usage. Like if you have to learn the 12 timetables, you start thinking, well, how many eggs in that dozen over there? And if you had two cartons, you know, how many eggs would you have then? And if you had three cartons, how many eggs would you have? You know, you make it so it attaches to something that's real. So it's not this abstract, this you know, hairy fairy, whatever magic that's going on. Yeah. But well, don't I'm get me started on that. I stuff. love teaching. I love <laughs> math. So I can talk on that all, all day long, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been amazing having you once again. And um, you can find this podcast on YouTube. The video will be on YouTube. And the podcast is on all podcast platform. Uh, you can find all of this information on AmericanGypsy.com. And all of the links, including uh, Sharon's information, will be on the description. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. And Peace. consistent self-improvement. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>